Hello again. Today we go to the world of opera. This is this strange art form where it's a play, but instead of people speaking, they sing. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. The Greeks, to be heard, chanted and sang their plays, the great plays like Oedipus, were sort of sung. And somewhere around 1600, uh, composers thought they wanted to write like the Greeks. No one knows what those plays sounded like in the original. Their music, very little of it exists, and we can't read it anyway. But in the 1600s, composers started to write their own versions of what they thought were Greek dramas, this idea of music telling the story with words. And that's what opera was. They just called it opera because opera is the Italian word for the work. So you'd ask a composer, what are you working on? Well, my latest work is, but Italian is my latest opera is. And so we still call them operas today. Uh, it's not true that every word is sung. In the Italian tradition, you sing everything. At Beethoven's time, in the German tradition, and Beethoven was German, the unimportant dialogue was spoken, and then the more important dialogue was sung. So there's some spoken dialogue, and then there's the, uh, the sung stuff, in Italian, all sung. We usually play these things today in the original language because the translations feel very awkward, trying to sandwich those words into the, the rhythm of the music. The translations sound awkward, so if you go to the opera house today, they have super titles. They show the translation above the stage while the action happens below. Um, some of the excerpts we've got for you may have some super titles or subtitles, I can't remember now, but I also give you translations so you know what's happening in the action. So let's talk about opera. Um, opera begins just like ballet. You can start right with the opera, but often it starts with an overture. And remember, overtures come in different types. There's the overture that is the uh, classic overture, classical era, enlightenment overture, it's sonata form. Remember when we saw the ballet Prometheus? That was a simplified sonata form, like the first movement of a symphony. Or the, the more romantic idea, the, uh, the music of the overture can tell the story or part of the story of the opera. Or in a very romantic idea, when artists were trying to sell themselves, it could be a collection of greatest hit tunes from the opera, and just make sure everyone's familiar with the melodies. So there's three ways you can write an overture, but its basic function is to get people quiet in their seats so the action can start. Remember, they're all out there buying oranges and eating their oranges, and now they get to sit and watch the action. And then once the play begins, we have arias. But before we get to the arias, so you're singing some dialogue. Some of the dialogue is not very important. It's just to get the plot going. And that stuff is sung very, very quickly, or often it's sung quickly. It may be dramatic, but it may not be. And it usually doesn't have much melody. There's a name for that, and you're going to see the name on the PowerPoint slides. It's recitativo. It's spelled without a CH. It's a C in Italian. It's pronounced like a CH. It's recitativo. This is the singular. Recitativi is the plural. Now, a lot of people don't use the Italian. They use the English, same word, recitative. Recitative is completely acceptable if you want to talk about it. If you don't know the word at all, it's fine too. But it's recitative is the dialogue you get through fast, and then the song is the aria. So recitative. Uh, opera singers are pretty funny because everyone hates these recitatives. They're hard to learn, they're hard to sing, and there's no glory in them. So they're referred to as wretcheds by opera singers. That's just kind of an in-joke, but they call it a wretched. It's the recitative. Then comes the aria. Now, the word aria is the same word in, as the English word air. Back uh, 400 years ago, when you talk about songs and dances, we didn't call them songs. They were called airs and dances. The archaic word for song is air. And so the same word in Italian, aria, just means a song. So you get the song. You have the recitative the fast dialogue, and then finally the melody comes in from the song. Let me give you a silly example. Now, I cannot sing at all, but I'm going to make something up, and please hold your ears, but you'll get the idea. So the recitative might be something like this. I'm going to the store to buy some milk. I'm buying some milk and cookies and cookies and maybe some orange juice and a dozen eggs. That's recitative. Get through it fast. Well, then the aria. The aria is where the big emotion comes. No milk, no milk, the store is out, it's out of milk. My cookies are ruined, no milk. That's the aria, the emotional part. The fast stuff, recitative, emotional parts, aria. Now most of what we think about of 
of opera are these arias. The singers get up there and they sing, and the purpose of the aria is, of course, the melody, the song. It's also to show off the voice, how loud it can be, how high it can go, how fast it can go. There's lots of how emotional it can be. But after you show off the voice, you can't be listening to arias all day long. Some of these operas go three and four hours long, so it's a lot of variety. You know, a monologue is great, but a dialogue is better. Two singers, we call that a duet. Three singers, a trio, four, a quartet, five, a quintet. We do a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of times, too, where the music just keeps changing, but it never stops. You know, an aria, you stop and people clap. Those are called scenes. Somebody comes in, it's a trio. They leave, it's a duet. More people come in, the chorus comes in. These scenes are very common, particularly at the ends of operas or the ends of acts. They're trying to get that, you know, the excitement build to get the whole cast in there, keep the action moving, not stop for anything. And there's also choruses. You know, we don't always want to hear solo voices. Sometimes we want to hear lots of voices together. That's called a chorus. It has a lot of purpose. It might be the voice of every man, you know, in the street. Or in the Beethoven's could be prisoners in the jail. It could be also like the Greek tragedies. It could just comment on the action, a chorus, commenting on the action. But there's choruses. There are also often dances, marches. Anything that you can do on stage accompanied to music can be an opera. So opera's this theater that's all this stuff put together. When you put it together, you get a very powerful art form when it's done well, and if it's the kind of thing you like. Now, we're going to look at one particular opera. This is Fidelio. It's the only opera Beethoven wrote. He wrote it relatively early in his career, relatively, uh, and it took a long time and many iterations to get it right. So we're going to walk through it a little bit. Here's start with the plot, and then the overture and some of the music, and you're going to be asked to Listen to some of this music, and we've got some YouTube clips. You can actually see it staged, and there's translations that have been uploaded to Canvas. So you've got a lot of material to help you enjoy this. Here's the plot. Fidel, not to Fidel, sorry, um, uh, Floristan is a man who, before the action starts, he was very outspoken politically. And he got on the wrong side of a guy named Pizarro. And Pizarro basically has him taken and thrown in prison secretly. No one knows where he is, but he disappears. And for two years, his wife, Leonora, has been searching for him, and she has a sense it's probably in this prison that Pizarro's running. So she disguises herself as a boy. She disguises herself as a boy named Fidelio, the faithful one, of course, and she starts working in this prison. Now, it's very strange, and of course, you always have to open with comedy, even serious operas. It's a strange scene. We find out that the man who's running the prison, not the owner, but the guy who's just the, the, the key keeper, his daughter, who works in the prison, falls in love with Fidelio, not knowing it's Leonora. In the meantime, there's another guy who's in love with this daughter because, well, you know, they're both working in the prison, they're in love. So there's this kind of love triangle. Uh, but that disappears pretty quickly. Leonora discovers that Florestan is in this prison. She gets to go deep into the prison. And she also finds out that Florestan's friend, who actually rules the country, is going to be inspecting the prison. And so Pizarro's decided to murder Florestan before he gets there. And he just tells his, uh, his associates, put a trumpet player up in, the, in, up in the turret so that if they see this guy coming, they can sound the trumpet and they know that it's all over. So Pizarro goes down to murder Florestan. Fidelio stands between Florestan or Leonora, between Florestan and Pizarro. There's a face-off, except that uh, Fidelio, Leonora, has a gun. And before she can shoot him, we hear the trumpet, like Gabriel's trumpet, out in heaven. And they realize they're saved. So this is basically the plot. It's what's called a French-style rescue drama. These were very popular, these ideas of the, of the last-minute rescue. And the story of the faithful wife is important. And, but it's also political drama, I think. I mean, you've got the story of the political, um, the, uh, you know, the political prisoner who gets freed, despotism versus freedom. So here are the clips you're going to hear. You're going to start with this quartet that's everyone in love with everyone else, the sort of half comic, half serious opening um, scene. And that's interesting because it's actually a round, what we call a canon in music, like row, row, row your boat, or forever Jaca. any of those you can sing as a round. This is a round, there's a long melody, and one person starts, and the next person comes in, the next. They're singing very different words, but the same music. Formally, very interesting. Remember, Enlightenment is the era of form. And then we get to Leonora's aria, which is very passionate. It's got a recitative and an aria, and the recitative is intense. At least it's sort of a traditional form, but its intensity is really strong. 
Then we'll get to your forest dance, where the form is breaking down, and it's a longer scene, and it's very dramatic. I would think more romantic without that strong form. And in this case, forest dance sees an image of Leonora as an angel. And religious iconography is going to run through this whole piece. We're going to have to figure out what that means. Um, so we do that scene. We also have a prisoner's chorus, uh, where there's all these pr political prisoners, and they get a chance to see the sunlight for a very brief moment. It's very powerful music. Again, is it political or what? You get to decide. Is it just a musical idea, a political idea, a plot idea? You get to decide. There's no answer. Um, we then get to the final scene. So now we've got Leonora pointing the gun and Fidelio, um, uh, forced and behind her, and Pizarro with a knife, and the trumpet sounds. It's quite a lengthy scene. They announce they've been saved and they're in love for each other and the prisoners get released. I mean, it's really just fantastic, fantastic music. And that brings us to the Fidelio. And when you're done with that, you have to figure, what is Beethoven trying to tell us? We have words, we have a plot, and then we have all this music. And some of the music is about form and some is about passion. It's, you know, you get to decide. One last note, the overture is so interesting to this. Beethoven wrote four of them. He wrote one overture called Leonora. It was now called Leonora, I think, number two. Um, and it was okay. He didn't like it that much, so he replaced it with Leonora number three. And this is a great concert piece. We do it all the time. It's in sonata form. And it's in a very complex sonata form, so it's, it's rich formally. But it also has tunes from the opera and really tries to tell the story of the entire opera. Um, it's way too difficult for most pits pit orchestras to get together as quickly as you need to for opera, and it wasn't successful. It was very hard to play. It's also lengthy. It's like 15 minutes, and people want the opera to start. Beethoven wrote a shortened version for a, a another production, and that's called the Leonore Number no. 1 Overture. Mistakenly, people thought it was written first. We know better now. So we've got our three Leonora Overtures, the third being the most common. And then Beethoven said, this is not how you start an opera. And he wrote another overture called Fidelio. And Fidelio is much shorter. Uh, it has no tunes from the opera. It does try to show the opera plot a little bit, um, but it's much more contained. So you get to talk about whether he's thinking classically or romantically, and in fact, he would change his mind. He has different overtures. Uh, I've not asked you to listen to the overture, but the Fidelio and the Leonora Number no. 3 are both wonderful overtures, but very, very different from each other. That's just a little side note as you try to figure out who Beethoven is and what was important to him. Enjoy these operas. I hope you do. You're not required to. You're, you have whatever taste you like, but I hope that you get pleasure out of it. Why would you take this course if it wasn't for enjoyment? And I will see you in a little while.